My title, Communism or Neo-Feudalism, gestures to Rosa Luxemburg's Socialism or Barbarism. She presents that alternative in the Junius pamphlet, which was written in 1915 while she was in jail. As you'll probably know, the pamphlet excoriates the shameful capitulation of the German Social Democrats to German imperialism when they voted for war credits. My wager is that today, the alternative confronting global capitalist society is communism or feudalism. The capitalist dynamics that consolidate the dominance of monopolies and finance capital, to use Lenin's definition of imperialism, these are producing a neo-feudalism of parcelized sovereignty, hierarchy and expropriation with new lords and serfs, desolate hinterlands and privileged municipalities, and widespread insecurity and catastrophism. Communism, the internationalist, universalist, and emancipatory egalitarian movement toward the abolition of private property and, and the abolition of the division of labor, and the construction of a society where production is based on need, commun this communism is the only alternative that provides a future for most of us. If we're to avoid going further down the neo-feudal path, we have to organize as communists for communism. The alternative of communism or neo-feudalism provides a heuristic for grappling with where we are and what futures we might collectively create. So I reject the idea that the big confrontation today is between democracy and fascism. This occludes the fundamental character of the economy. It prevents us from seeing why ostensibly democratic polities are turning so sharply to the right. And of course, the answer is economic. The, net, the, network techno, the networked technological society, what I call communicative capitalism, especially under conditions of climate change, amplifies the concentration of wealth in the few and the dispossession of the many. That is, it intensifies tendencies to feudalism. Now, I expect that most of you recall the line from Frederick Jameson that was made famous by Slavoj Žižek and Mark Fisher, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than an end to capitalism. I'm not convinced that this holds any longer. In recent years, we've seen a whole slew of active imaginings of an end of capitalism, or at least of a radically different mode for the production and appropriation of the social surplus. So I'm thinking of movies like The Hunger Games, popular fiction featuring dystopic futures, science fiction, uh, Game of Thrones, all the array of survivalisms. The world continues, and it's not capitalist. The very few optimistic versions suggest a kind of post-scarcity. The more common dystopic versions rely on direct expropriation, right? violence, coercion, and force. One might say, well, these non-capitalist economies are not part of a world anyone would want to live in. And that's my point. We can imagine an end to capitalism, just not one we would actually want. If these given by, if these imaginaries or these imaginaries that are given by the dominant culture have it, are anything to go by, that's what they want us to think, right? These non-capitalist futures are worse than what we have, and so they ideologically make us kind of want to hold on to capitalism as well. It's probably better than the alternatives. Now, one strand among these imaginings of non-capitalism is a kind of neo-medievalism. Already in the 1970s, right, which was a time of capitalist crisis that would usher in neoliberalism as its temporary resolution, already in the 70s, Umberto Eco noted an enthusiasm for the Middle Ages, even as which Middle Ages or which aspect of the Middle Ages um, was going to be dominant was, um, was for Eco an open question. He read the postmodern itself as a kind of new medievalism, and he attended to parallels such as the absence of centering authority, additive and compositive art, nomadic wanderers, insecurity, mysticism, and, ap and apocalypticism. In the 1990s, scholars of international relations were also thinking and talking about neo-medievalism. <laughs> 
They saw parallels between the Middle Ages and the post-1989 world in the complex layers of interconnection character characteristic of globalization. They saw it in the multipolarity and non-territoriality of power, as in, for example, multinational firms and global elites. And they also saw it in the capacity of these firms and elites to manipulate and circumvent state authority, in social fragmentation, and in the dissolution of distinctions between public and private. For example, as in like private security forces. Um, as in the old Middle Ages, so in the new ones, security is a privilege. It's not a right provided by the state, rather it's something that can be bought. Now, more recently, there have emerged specific criticisms of the present in terms of neo-feudalism. In the United States, conservative and libertarian economists have started to ask whether the future of the US is mass serfdom, that is a propertyless underclass only able to survive by servicing the needs of high earners, for example, as personal assistants, trainers, childminders, cooks, cleaners, and so on. The most visible of these right-wing economists defend private property and suburban home ownership, right, like the construction and real estate sectors. They defend fossil fuels, cars, plastics, fertilizer, and the kind of corporate agribusiness that requires fertilizer. And they defend a view of freedom and democracy that they associate with the American way of life, a way of life typically envisioned as white and middle class. These conservative and libertarian economists oppose what they depict as the green elitism of sustainability, less is more hipster downsizing, and they position these as components of a kind of Silicon Valley Hollywood billionaire ideology of high-speed rail and technology. For example, Joel Kotkin argues that sustainability is a liberal politics of the rich that hurts the majority. Energy, agribusiness, and construction employ more people than high tech and finance, so that means they are better for the majority of people. Kotkin writes, the old economic regime emphasized growth and upward mobility. In contrast, the new economic order focuses more on the notion of sustainability, so reflective of the feudal worldview, over rapid economic expansion, end quote. Presenting a division within the capitalist class as if it were a division between the many and the few, right? in other words, as a populist division, Kotkin places the oil and gas sector on the side of the people. High tech, finance, and globalization are the enemy, threatening, quote, to create a new social order that in some ways more closely resembles feudal structure with its often unassailable barriers to mobility than the chaotic emergence of industrial capitalism, end quote. A number of technology analysts share the libertarian critique of technology's role in contemporary feudalization, even as they don't embrace fossil fuels and suburbia. Already in 2010, um, in his influential book, You Are Not a Gadget, tech guru Jaron Lanier observed the emergence of peasants and lords of the internet. And this theme has only increased in prominence as a handful of tech companies have become ever richer and more extractive, turning their owners into billionaires on the basis of the cheap labor of their workers, the free labor of their users, and the tax breaks bestowed on them by cities and countries desperate to attract jobs and investment. As everyone knows, five tech firms have become astronomically wealthy and powerful, the most valuable companies in the world. Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet, which is the parent company for Google. Collectively, these companies are worth more than almost every country in the world, except the US, China, Germany, and Japan. Apple alone is worth more than the Netherlands. The economic scale and impact of these tech supergiants, or overlords, is greater than that of most so-called sovereign states. Yevgeny Morozov, in particular, has drawn out the feudalization accompanying the rise of these tech supergiants. He writes, the downside, never mind the privacy disaster, 
is that they pay almost no taxes. Their penchant for moonshots undermines any state-led innovation efforts. Their welfareism cannot possibly last forever. In fact, the latter is likely to result in the hypermodern form of feudalism, whereby those of us caught up in their infrastructure will have to pay for access to anything with screen or a button. Shoshana Zuboff's study of surveillance capitalism brings out a further dimension of tech feudalism, military service. Like lords to kings, Facebook and Google cooperate with powerful states, sharing information that these states are legally barred from gathering themselves. So overall then, the extractive dimension of network technologies is pervasive, intrusive, and unavoidable. unavoidable. So to sum up my first point, um, the claim that the present has tendencies that point in a medi medieval or more specifically neo-feudal direction is not new. Neo-medievalism was already a thematic in the late 20th century and more recently concerns with concentrations of wealth and their impact on property as well as with the expropriative character of digital technologies have been expressed in terms of an emergent neo-feudalism. People are sensing that some kind of alternative to capital is possible, but they think it's awful. Now I imagine if there are any medievalists in the room that they're freaking out because there have been debates in the term, um, there have been debates in the field over the accuracy of the term feudalism, its applicability to different, culture, different countries, whether one can even speak of feudalism as a coherent whole, in what sense there was ever a transition to or out of feudalism, and so on. And these are real and important debates, but they have nothing to do with what I'm talking about because what I'm trying to do is identify contemporary tendencies toward a new feudalism. And my claim is that contemporary capitalism, specifically the power law dynamics of complex networks that result in a winner-take-all or winner-take-most distribution, tend toward feudalism. Now before I develop that power law, that power law point, I'm going to identify four interlocking features of feudalism that are relevant to thinking about present tendencies. First, the parcelization of sovereignty. Perry Anderson and Ellen Mikesons Wood emphasize parcelization of sovereignty as a key fe feature of feudalism. State functions are vertically and horizontally fragmented. Local arrangements take a variety of forms. Justice loses its prior formality as local practices substitute for general dominion. Personal bonds replace official roles. Arbitration and compromise take place of the rule of law, and the line between the legal and the illegal becomes weaker. Second, hierarchy and expropriation, or peasants and lords. Feudal relations are characterized by a fundamental inequality. Wood emphasizes that the distinct feature of feudalism in the West is, quote, the exploitation of peasants by lords in the context of parcelized sovereignty. Exploitative monopolies, such as water mills that were controlled by the Lord, were characteristic of feudalism. Peasants had to pay to have their um, grain ground at the Lord's mill, um, even as they worked um, for the Lord, occupying the Lord's land, even though, and they did not own it. Right? They dwelled under conditions where the feudal Lord was the manager and master of the process of production and the entire process of social life, um, to quote Marx. Third characteristic, cities and hinterlands. And this is a spatiality associated with feudalism, um, one where they're protected, often lively centers, surrounded by agricultural and desolate hinterlands. We might also characterize this as a split between town and country, municipal and rural areas, urban communes and the surrounding countryside, or more abstractly, between an inside walled off from an outside, a division between what is secured and what is endangered, between who is prosperous and who is desperate. Wood says that medieval cities were essentially oligarchies, with dominant classes enriched by commerce and financial services for kings, emperors, and popes. Collectively, they dominated the surrounding countryside, extracting wealth from it in one way or another. 
correlative to this division are the nomads and migrants who, facing unbearable conditions, seek new places to live and work, yet all too often come up against the walls. Their real conditions at the edge of survival become mirrored back to them in the fears of the protected who can never be safe enough. So fourth, the fourth characteristic is insecurity and apocalypticism. You, um, um, it's important for thinking about ten neo-feudal tendencies in the present because it gives us this affective and subjective dimension, right? The, sub the subjective dimension of insecurity and fear. So it's not too hard. It doesn't take a big leap to see these four elements today. We can point to global financial institutions and their extractivist use of debt to redistribute wealth from the world's poorest to the riches. We can recall the 10% of global wealth hoarded in offshore accounts to avoid taxation, that is, to escape the reach of state law. And as I mentioned earlier, the largest tech companies have valuations greater than the economies of most of the world. Cities and countries relate to Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Alphabet as if they were sovereign states, negotiating with, trying to attract, and cooperating with them on their terms. So sovereignty is parcellated and fragmented, and it is, it's that way on domestic fronts as well. Palestine is a clear example, as Israeli settlers b illegally build up settlements on Palestinian land under the protection of Israeli military forces. An example from the US, cash-strapped communities use elaborate systems of fines to expropriate money from people directly, usually impacting poor people the hardest. In her book, Punishment Without Crime, Alexandra Natapoff documents the dramatic scope of misdemeanor law in the already enormous US carceral system. Poor people, disproportionately people of color, are arrested on bogus charges and convinced to plead guilty so as to avoid jail time. Um, they would have jail time if they decided to contest the charges and weren't able to pay bail. Not only does the guilty plea then go on their record, but they stand to accrue fines that, again, if they can't afford to pay, will turn into more fines and more charges. We got a brief look into this system of legal illegality in the wake of the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, that followed the murder of Michael Brown. Quote, the city's municipal court and policing apparatus openly extracted millions of dollars from its low-income African-American population, end quote. Police were instructed, quote, to make arrests and issue citations in order to raise revenue, end quote. Like minions of feudal lords, the cops used force to expropriate value from the people. Of course, it's not quite right to say that the present is characterized by peasants and lords, even in countries that still have royalty. But it is right to say that contemporary capitalist society is characterized by an intensification of inequality, more billionaires, greater distance between rich and poor, the solidification of a differentiated legal system that protects corporations and the rich while it immiserates and incarcerates the poor. Fortunes are made through the proliferation of mechanisms of direct expropriation, from bank fees for every possible transaction, the disaggregation of services into separate chargeable elements, to illegal foreclosures and direct wage theft, which are widespread and impossible to address for people who can't afford lawyers. Um, with all this, the finance sector systematically takes from the poor to give to the rich. And of course, it is necessary once again to mention the technology sector, which takes our data, whether we share it or not, and aggregates and mines and sells it in the contemporary equivalent of the water mill. At this point, we need our phones and internet. We cannot not choose our own expropriation. With respect to cities and hinterlands, Phil Neal's recent book, Hinterland, notes the patterns between China Egypt, Ukraine, and the United States, and so far as all are places with dissolute, abandoned wastelands and cities on the brink of overload. Neil's account of the stratification and struggle across the international periphery echoes arguments made by IR scholars 30 years ago. Already in 1998, 
Philip Cheerney was writing of the, quote, growing alienation between global innovation, communication, and resource nodes, global cities, on the one hand, and disfavored, fragmented hinterlands on the other. Cheerney warned of the resulting exclusion and lumpenization, especially insofar as large geographical spaces will be starved of infrastructure and support. Quote, many people will simply be out of the loop. Country bumpkins or even roaming deprived bands forced once again to become predators or supplicants on the cities as in the Middle Ages, end quote. Finally, insecurity and catastrophism link these three together. And the thing is, there are good reasons for most of us to feel insecure. The catastrophe of capitalist expropriation of the social surplus in the setting of a warming, pla warming planet is real. Now my argument is not that just that there are parallels with feudalism. My argument is that capitalism is tending toward a neo-feudalism. Now you might be thinking, well, that's not a very Marxist position. Um, you might think that Marx has a reductive determinist theory of stages and transition where capitalism comes out of feudalism and the next stage is necessarily socialism. But that's not my view and it's actually not Marx's either. Marx was more nuanced than that. Marx acknowledged the coexistence of different modes of production and the ways this coexistence can intensify specific tendencies in the different modes, making domination and immiseration even worse. In a related vein, Rosa Luxemburg was herself attentive to capitalism's reliance on non-capitalist modes external to it. And even more significant, she drew out the way that the primitive accumulation Marx places in the feudal period is an ongoing characteristic of capitalism. Direct appropriation rather than exchange is a feature of capitalism, not a bug, not an exception. In a discussion of feudal appearing elements in Latin America, Andrew Gunder Frank furthers this discussion. He argues that what appears as feudal is an effect of economic development under capitalism, in this instance of imperialism. So the argument then is that feudalization is a continuation of the logic of imperialism. Now Lenin famously theorized imperialism as an intensification of capital concentration, monopolies, and financial oligarchy. Complex networks, right, digital communication information networks, amplify these tendencies toward inequality as they result in power law distributions. In his book, Linked, Albert Laszlo Barabasi sets out the formal characteristics of power law distributions in complex networks. And these are networks which are characterized by free choice, growth, and preferential attachment. So people voluntarily make links or choices. The number of links per site grow over time. People like things because others like them. So it's generally the case that in networks of this sort, the most, then you just think, for example, of the most popular book or restaurant or internet site, the most popular will have roughly twice as many links or hits as the second most popular, which is twice as many as a third um, most, and so on, all the way down to the insignificant number of differences between those low in the food chain or in the long tail of the distribution curve. This winner-take-all or winner-take-most effect is the power law shape of the distribution. So the, again, the one at the top has significantly more than the ones at the bottom. So the shape that this kind of distribution takes is not a bell curve, it's a long tail. And you know, one of the most um, typical examples is Twitter, right? The most popular people on Twitter have over 100 million followers. Those ranked around nine or 10 have roughly 50 million followers, and the average person has 200. The structure of complex networks induces competition, right? For attention, resources, money, jobs, anything that is given a network form. And it leads to concentration. Free choice, growth, and preferential attachment produce hierarchies. 
power law distributions, where those at the top have vastly more than those at the bottom. Another way to understand the same point, hierarchies are imminent to networks. They are not transcendental impositions. Getting rid of them, combating them, requires an imposition, a cut, a beheading, a disruption of the system that produces them. Abolishing imminent hierarchies, in other words, requires politics. If we think of digital networks as turning us into constant producers of communicative capitalism's primary resource, information, we gain in further insight into neo-feudalization. It's like we cannot escape subjection. The classic Marxist distinction between feudalism and capitalism was that feudalism, that feudalism relied on direct expropriation and capitalism relied on free workers freely selling their labor power. Now Marx was clear that this fiction broke down in the hidden abode of the factory where there is no equality between capitalist and worker. In the networked social factory that we have today, even the fiction of free production has dissolved. In sum then, the structure of complex networks demonstrates why contemporary capitalism is tending toward a new feudalism. So where's communism, right? You keep, thought we were gonna talk about communism. If my wager of feudalization is tendencies is correct, then how do we find the communist alternative and what does it look like? Well, one of the problems on the left today is that some of the ideas that are the most popular actually reinforce feudalization, or at the very least, they fail to confront it because they're trapped within the imaginary. Localization affirms parcelization. parcelization. Municipalism affirms the urban-rural division. Emphases on subsistence and survival proceed as if peasant economies were plausible, not only for that half of the planet that lives in cities, which includes 82% of North Americans and 74% of Europeans, but they proceed as if it's plausible for the millions of people displaced by climate change, war, and commercial land theft. The problem for most dwelling in the hinterlands is that their political, culture, and cultural, and economic conditions are such that they can't make a living through agriculture. Right? Approximately 50 countries are classified as low-income food deficit countries, and most of these will bear the brunt of the changing climate. UBI, universal basic income, is a similarly untenable survivalist approach. It promises just enough to keep those in the hinterlands going, so long as they don't go to the cities where they can't afford to live. The fourth element, insecurity and apocalypse, takes shape as that left catastrophism, preoccupied with extinction and the end of the world, as if the next couple of hundred years don't matter. Now these positions suggest a vision of the future that looks like small groups and communes engaged in subsistence farming um, and maybe the production of artisanal cheese, perhaps on the edges of cities where survivalist enclaves and drone-wielding tech workers alike experiment with urban gardens. Such groupings reproduce their lives in common, yet the commons they reproduce is necessarily small, local, and in some sense exclusive and elite. Exclusive insofar as their numbers are necessarily limited. Elite because the aspirations are culturally specific rather than widespread. It's like the basic view of the future on a broad, swath, a broad part of the left is of cool cities surrounded by organic farms with little attention to farming's mode of production. This reifies the division of labor. Did the farmers choose to be farmers or were they born this way? Do they own their land, share it, export their products? And what about the hidden conditions that make the cool cities possible? The builders, cleaners, and maintainers of infrastructure, the providers of transportation and communication, the carers for health, education, and children, are the cities cool for them? The way that some left ideas converge is thus via an abandonment of the hinterlands and a cultivation of those elements of the urban that benefit the rich and educated, right? our robot future. 
Far from a vision anchored in the emancipation of the working class, the model can't even see a working class. It looks instead like a wealthy fortress surrounded by a combination of farms and wastelands. When work is imagined, and of course some on the left think that we should adopt a post-work imaginary, when work is imagined, it looks either like romantic risk-free farming or immaterial labor. What has been erased is industry, manufacturing, the production and maintenance of infrastructure, as well as the wide array of labor necessary for social reproduction. Given that most cities are on coasts, this model lacks the foresight necessary for responding to the changing climate. A better version of the future has to begin with climate change. And this means imagining not just alternative energy, but new ways of living for the millions who will lose their livelihoods once it's finally clear that fossil fuels must be kept in the ground. We must also imagine an end to the rural-urban divide, right? That is a change in the patterns of urbanization and the division between mental and physical labor. Vast, we have to imagine vastly expanded cooperative science and research, the development and production of new modes of transportation and new practices of dwelling, new approaches to cleaning up, repairing, and transforming areas damaged by extractivism. Common tasks can be exciting and invigorating, especially when they are understood as common and when commoning moves beyond farming and housework. Now I'm gonna conclude with communist alternatives to the tendencies to feudalism. Parcelization should be understood not in terms of localism, but as the weakening of the nation state necessary for communist universalism. It must be rendered not as fragmentation and separation, but rather as conduits for a new internationalism. Transnational organizations, from financial institutions, corporations, and social media platforms, to parties, issue alliances, and political formations, suggest the plausibility of communizing structures across and beyond nation states. The only problem is that today, most serve capitalist rather than communist ends. It's hard, but it's not hard to imagine them repurposed as components of a diverse communist ecosystem, one devoted not to capital accumulation and protecting the hordes and privileges of the billionaires, but to the emancipatory egalitarian flourishing of the many. Getting there, of course, requires political struggle. The capitalist class doesn't just roll over. But the parcelization of sovereignty reminds us that their power is more fragile than any of us often acknowledge. And it gives us a way to think about international communist organizations as a complex tangle of associations operating in ways that exceed the simple geometry of vertical and horizontal or the cliched geography of local and global. Lords and peasants, that is hierarchy, inequality, expropriation, and the long tail. This one's easy. The communist path recognizes this division as the class conflict that it is and takes the side of the peasants and proletarianized. Such a trajectory already has momentum in the peasant organizing carried, about, um, carried on by Via Campesina, to use just one example. Eliminating the lords means abolish private property and seize the means of communication, production, and transportation, making production serve human need. It's not hard to dissolve trillions of dollars of fictitious capital. The capitalist system does this regularly. We just do it intentionally. And we'd need to deliberate on what sort of technologies we want and need and their real costs. For example, are we willing to um, do time in cold tan mines for the sake of cell phones? Do we want to abolish the collection of metadata entirely or find ways to use it to better assess needs? Liberated from the constraints of capital accumulation, we could finally grapple with fundamental choices regarding our collective life rather than having these choices determined for us and behind our backs. With respect to cities and hinterlands, the end of an economy of capital accumulation makes possible the dissolution of the rural-urban divide and the division of labor that drives it. More concretely and immediately, with a vision of communism mindful of the hinterlands, we open up new possibilities for organized struggle that build from current tendencies, right? You can think of the, the Maoist injunction to surround the city. 
At any rate, the intensifying politics around migration and refugees, the class struggles unfolding in various forms on the outskirts of cities, and the growing anger of the hinterlands dispossessed that we see vividly in France and in the electoral politics driving the rightward shift in the US, Hungary, Poland, Canada, and elsewhere give us a setting of real struggle that is as yet undecided. There's nothing inevitable about the shift to the right. It's a matter of organizing, of offering a politics that speaks to a wide array of human needs and concerns that offers a possibility of flourishing. Finally, instead of being plagued by insecurity and apocalypticism, we can and must cultivate communist virtues of solidarity, courage, discipline, and confidence Virtues that emerge out of and engender a sense of comradeship. Anything less dooms us to neo-feudalism. That's it. <laughs>